My name's Anthony Hamilton Russell. I'm the second generation owner of Hamilton Russell Vineyards, founded by my father in 1975, first vintage 81. I took over in 1991 and bought the business from the family in 1994. I'm in my 30th year and Hamilton Russell Vineyards is celebrating its 40th first vintage and the release of the 40th vintage this year. The kind of early 80s, uh, the writing was on the wall for how the country was going. Apartheid was really um, nearing a peak. Uh, there were riots on campus, riot police turning up on campus. There was just a, a lot of tension in the air. Like a lot of young South Africans, I decided to make a future in another country. I left the country to go to Britain. People say there's a seven year itch for South Africans that leave the country. Uh, wanting to get home, obviously one, one misses everything one grew up with and the essence of the countries in your blood in one way and another. And Mandela was released in 1990 and that opened a whole new era of possibility for the country. And I decided um, that I wanted to return. Dezo Pongratz at that time said to him, you should try completely new areas. And he encouraged my father to look much further afield. And uh, my father, having done geography at Oxford and loving maps, I remember maps lying around all over the place. And he literally took him seriously and started methodically looking at all possible new areas. I still believe we settled on Amanus for a number of reasons. Not only uh, is this farm unusually close to the sea. If you're this close to the sea in Nogales, you're basically on sand. The family had been coming to Amanus. You know, my father had spent nearly every Christmas of his childhood here. My grandfather bought a house just after the Second World War, and Amanus had a deep emotional significance to my father. And he was with the estate agent, and the estate agent tore up ahead of them on the then dirt road up the Himalanada Valley. He turned off the road, went up to the house where Emil now lives, and he knocked on the door and he said to the, to, to the owner, he said, listen, I've, I've got an Englishman with me and he wants to buy a farm. <laughs> he said, he said oh, is your farm for sale? Are you interested? And the guy said, yeah, let's talk. And, you know, the rest is history. That's how my dad got hold of this farm called Braemar and how he began developing it from scratch. I know that's a cliche, but we want to be a force for good, not just for our own staff, but for our community in general, for the environment in particular, and also for our customers. And we're very conscious of the fact that Hamilton Russell is bigger than any of us as individuals now. It's become something that we serve, not the other way around. Hamilton Russell will long outlive me personally, um, the legacy of my father before me, uh, my children even. My absolute passion is for this place. Yeah. And it's not all of Hamilton Russell because I'm not dead keen to try and make a wine in the sandstone soil over here that's going to rival our Pinot and Chardonnay. My passion is for a 52 hectare northeast facing bump of really old clay and iron rich soil that happens to be closer to the sea for that soil type, I believe, than anywhere else you can find. We have a genuine deep conservation and environmental ethic in our industry. When I meet other farmers, you know, it's a cost center. That, that area is not earning money for you. Um, and yes, you might have mountain bikers coming through and charge them or sell walks or, you know, have a hut in the hills that you rent out. But really, it is a heartfelt passion for so many of the wine farmers I meet to conserve the environment. And this whole sustainable ethic the industry has is underpinned with integrity and I think that is a fabulous strength and now more than ever you know even after COVID the environment the climate change um, CO2 friendliness conservation those things are really big and it's heartfelt in this industry this nature reserve is very dear to our hearts long before the biodiversity and wine initiative we designated uh, this 39 odd hectares um, as to be untouched, untouched Cape Mountain Feinbos. And we have an initiative underway to join up the Cape Mountain Feinbos of the other producers in the Himalanada to try and form an unbroken ring of private nature reserve around the whole appellation. I prefer the term Himalanada to Himalanada Valley. Himalanada Valley is specifically our appellation within the Himalanada. And beyond us, you get the upper Himalanada Valley 
and then just in the next river valley that runs out to sea at the Klein River Lagoon over there, not the Onrust River Lagoon over there, you have Himalanada Ridge. Walker Bay was defined really by the influence of Walker Bay, which is 1,500 meters that way. Cold current coming up from Antarctica, very much part of the South Atlantic, not Indian Ocean. And the cooling influence of that accessed areas going up three river valleys. I started getting worried that Walker Bay would lose relevance as the smallest unit of Appalachian. We had wonderful um, Syrah and Shannon Blanc coming out of Bot River. We had great Pinot Noir and Chardonnay coming out of our section of the Himalanada and increasingly in other areas. We had Stanford flirting with several other grape varieties. And what would never to be happen over time is people would say Walker Bay and not really know what we stood for. So I came up with the idea of breaking away from Walker Bay and, to, and creating more relevant units of appellation around the more defined area that we specifically were in for Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. The reason for there being an upper Himalanada Valley and a Himalanada Valley is quite simply the change of soil types. In the Himalanada Valley, Pinot and Chardonnay is essentially planted on Bockefeld shale with a very high clay and iron content, with sandstone in the mountains often devoted to other uh, grape varieties. In the upper Himalanada Valley, you have a rare savely occurrence of decomposed granite and then the sandstone higher up. So if you're South African and you love Pinot Noir, you can say I love South African Pinot Noir. If you're a little more interested, you can say I prefer Himalanada Pinot to Elgin Pinot. If you're even more interested, you can say I prefer, say, Upper Himalanada Valley Pinot to Himalanada Valley Pinot. Our style changed from the 80s, the early 90s. I came back. I started pulling up all the BK5 and putting in Dijon clones. I didn't let them pick early. So they changed in the 90s, we, we pushed for greater ripeness, we were working with newer clones. So through the 90s you will see, and we had a budget for wood, we just borrowed the money, um, but we, we started getting a little riper and um, a little more clean wood presence and barrels purchased especially for the Pinot, not after the Chardonnay. By 1998 we had kicked into 100% new Dijon clones. We were the first to plant them on the property, so we got a four-year head start on the rest of the industry in knowing what we liked and didn't like. Um, so then by 2000s, um, and this was our kind of golden years to some extent because we had everything in production from my major replantings. Nothing that we had replanted had yet started picking up too much virus from everything else. So we were producing reasonably decent yields, we could ripen effortlessly, and we were making full-on kind of wines. The wines were unapologetically big and the O1 is just drinking beautifully if we had a bottle to show you at lunch. And Emil joined us in, uh, in 2015. And Emil has been a little much more close to the vineyards, I believe, with the, works very well with the vineyard manager. And our wines have got purer, more finessed and more elegant. But they still are typically Hamilton Rustlin having a muscularity and a tannin structure that is unusual for Pinot. And that's the clay and the iron. It's not working the caps hard and everything. And the 92 was a fabulous vintage. And we made a lot of it. Um, and I made my own wine from two rows that I selected, did all the pruning and all the work by hand, picked it, carried it to the cellar, did everything by hand, made it in three white dustbins. And I did that for five years because I wanted to have an excuse to be in the cellar. I wanted to learn all aspects of winemaking, be alongside the winemaker without being seen to pry. And, and that was a good exercise. I learned a lot from it. The weird little bit of symbolism is nature almost forced on us a throwback to some of our wines of the early 80s, which put us initially on the map. It's more Burgundian and not being overly varietal. It's got the Chardonnay has that hard minerality and that chalky dry sense with also the nice viscous textural edges and it's it's very much pears and limes and it's not tropical and it's it's got that mild whiff of eggshell reduction it's just to me what minerality would smell like if it did have a smell and our 2020 to me is just spot on typically Hamilton Russell again a flashback to the 80s where we would have been placed much more in the Cote de Beau so to me it's a kind of a Volne meets Poma Whereas generally people would be talking about Chevre meets Moi, Sandani, you know, for the for the Pinot. And I think the 2020, it, it's symbolic for us because it's going to be a hard to understand wine. It's not got 
lashings of easy to understand varietal fruit. It's, it's an intellectual wine. It's one that you've got to sit with, think about. It demands something of you. The next big step forward for South Africa that we've all experienced recently has been a, a more finely attuned aesthetic from our new generation winemakers playing into the hands more of fine wine lovers, not trying to make every man wines that just have wide consumer appeal. But we haven't allowed ourselves to be pigeonholed into just a pair of varieties. We actually make incredible Bordeaux blends, incredible Cabernets, incredible Syrahs. I like to believe incredible Pinot Noirs, albeit in not great quantities. I have enormous admiration for the resilience of people in the industry. And it's a bit like if you look in biology, if you reproduce vegetatively, in other words, if you take a successful plant and take a cutting and grow it again, you're not adapting to change that way. You are maximizing a current situation. In an industry that's rapidly changing, sexual reproduction throws out many variants. And a few survive and a few fail. And I guess my father, by trying a host, not a host, but five or six noble varieties here in a new site on old sheep and wheat farming soil, right next to the sea, that experiment threw up Pinot Noir and Chardonnay as the successes. We've honed in on that success and it's created a, a, a opportunities for many others around us. Thing. And what I think has been our success story um, I'd like to believe both financially and that is we decided a single Pinot, a single Chardonnay and relevant amounts. And so we can be in 60 countries and we can do something for how people think of high-end South African wine because we're there. One quote that I always liked and quoting Ronald Reagan is dangerous at the best of times but um, it might be someone else's but he said it. He said there's no limit to what you can accomplish if you don't mind who takes credit for your ideas. I call myself a modern traditionalist because you know a lot of people think of innovation as got to be technology and a move forward, whereas really a lot of the innovation in wine is a step backwards to how it was done. The almost spiritual beauty of expressing a place of deep meaning to me through wine. And that place happens to be here. I've had a relationship with the property from the day my father bought it in 1975. So, 45 years of my 59 years, I've had this deep connection to the place. And I can't put this in a suitcase, I can't ship it anywhere else, it has to be here. I love being a South African. We can kind of be based here where there's deep spiritual meaning and we can, we can live in the world. And I think that mix is just, for me, is perfection. I love it.